Hello, welcome to another episode of the Panicle Podcast for Geeks, the show about good friends hanging out, talking about the things we all love. I always have to read that, by the way. I don't have it memorized for some stupid reason. Uh, my <laughs> guest today is David Peterson uh, of Mouse Guard, um, and my co-host, Andrew Sides. Um, how's everybody doing this morning? For Sunday. Good. Hello, good, welcome. Yeah. David woke yeah, up really... early, extra early. I, yeah, I messed up the time. Uh... Because I forgot that there was a time difference between Chicago and where I am in Michigan. And so I set an alarm, got up early, took care of, you know, dog stuff, and then was like, so the all right, podcast for geeks. The what's show happening? Why aren't we going? <laughs> He's like, like, where are these fools at? <laughs> hour early. I thought Is the same thing okay? Andrew thought, actually. I thought Michigan, for some reason, was on the same time. But I should have known that because I have friends from Michigan. We're East Coast. Huh. Well, are you are you like right on the time zone change then, or is it still more west than than where no, you are? In all of all of Michigan is what is uh, east Eastern time. Oh, and okay. On, and I'm on the eastern edge of Michigan, so. Oh yeah, so you're like way off. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's oh, you're solid, solidly with me in Florida. <laughs> it's not yeah. like uh, where is it? Is it in Indiana that does like yeah. some other counties are don't yes. follow the rules. And I think so. There's a some of them are on different time zones, and then s- some of those, a smaller number of those, I think, some of them do and don't participate in daylight savings time. Correct, and that's oh. so trippy as all hell, a, man. All a mess trying to figure out when it is. I mean, luckily, I only go to Indianapolis, and that's where I stop <laughs> for Gen Con. I think that's as far as most of us go. Uh, mine is that one jacked up town I'm never going into again. I can't remember what it's called. I went to this town <laughs> one hour outside of Indianapolis and I went to get gas. And I was telling Andrew this. Uh, I told a bunch of people in Discord this. This, oh, late, right. this old lady at this gas station, I, I filled up. I went in to use the bathroom and I went to get some snacks. And as I was paying for the snacks, this old, she was really old, but she went, oh, we don't get a lot of colored folk around here. And I was just like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Get like, back oh, in my car and leave. I was like, well, she <laughs> said it in such a nice way. I was like, I can't well, Maybe tell. she was just excited. Maybe she yeah. just she doesn't know the right way to express that she's excited right. that there's some diversity coming in. I was just like, she's either really genuinely like, wow, I haven't really, seen. I it. mean, you got to read her attitude. Like, even though the, yeah, she wasn't like reaching for a gun or anything. So I was yeah, just like, yeah, cool. Yeah. I paid and I just casually walked. But I was like, I'm not sitting in this car. I was gonna right. eat in my yeah, car. Yeah. I was like, let's go, let's go. Um, <laughs> all right, well, let's let's start by talking about Mouse Guard because I think all that's right. the. Um, uh, obviously, that's how I know you for for start. I started reading Mouse Guard way back in the day, and then I met you for I met you at my very first convention in um, it was, was that C2E2 C2 or C2E2. Uh, I believe it was 2014. You were next to Corey Godby. Oh yeah, and he you guys were right right. They were like directly behind me, and Corey came over to talk to me and just be like, "Hey, how's it going?" You know, I was like, "This is my first time at a convention. I had no clue what I was doing. I was like, I don't even know how to set up this table." So he like. Help me. My, I didn't have a lot of stuff, but Corey like was like, put this here so people can see that there. And then he walked me over, and introduced me to you. Um, I didn't really get to know you really well at that show. You seemed like you did not want to talk, so I was just like, I'm not going to bother the man, <laughs> you know. Before, like, but again, like the doors opened. It was before doors opened, but yeah. like I said, it was like my first convention. So in my head, I was always like, don't. Nowadays, people know that I just walk up to artists and I talk to them. I'm like, hey, how's it going? My name's Alan. But back then, I I was like, I don't want to bother this guy. You've set up at a convention. You know. Yeah. Now I know. You're you're setting up at a convention. Like, not even setting up. Like, when you are walking in those doors, you are already realizing there's a list in your head of all the people (coughs) you want to get a chance to say hi to before the show starts. Yep. Yep. Then you're also mentally thinking about, not that you don't want to see people, but oh my God, that list is so much longer of all the people who probably will stop by to say hi. Yeah. Not that you don't want to see them, but you know, you have like this. Like I have, I, it's It's overwhelming. Yeah. So and so, I got to say hi and give them a hug or whatever. And on top of all that, you have this limited time for setup. So when other people start, stop by to like hi how you doing so what what's going on you're just like i yeah i got banners <laughs> price tags and now now oh, now i get it right because yeah. yeah you're like hey man let me catch up with you in a second i gotta set this sorry stuff if up. i yeah no, sorry you're if i was t- 
terse. Obviously, moment. we're friends now. It didn't. It didn't like. Well, I, I think we're friends. It didn't sour. My, <laughs> sour my experience and not sour you from talking to me. It soured. <clears throat> I was on that list. You know how David's talking about this list? He's got this list of people he really wants to talk to, and he's got this list of, like, God damn it, they're going to stop by and bother me. I'm on that list. <laughs> I'll stop by and bother. It's, it's the people who, like, like a Corey. I'm really good friends with Corey, and I barely get to see him at all. Right. And so, like, he's someone that I need to, like, actually stop and, you know, give a hug to and find out what's going on. I mean, and there are people who, like, I will see them <clears throat> through the course of the convention, and I don't need more than, you know, a little bit of time to say, hey, how's it going? How's life? Yeah. Um, that's the other list. It's not like, oh, they're all... I was totally joking. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's all right. Just we'll, to be tell, clear, we'll tell people about the hit list. out there watching is thinking like, oh, which, which list of Davids am I on? All it's of them. more like you've got really close friends that <clears throat> you need to spend some time substantive I mean, time with and then there are the people who like through, yeah. the, through the weekend you're gonna say hi at some point when yeah. i'm doing setup i need to do setup i mean to to your credit you know you did um we did, like san diego comic-con is a good example 2019 david and i went back and forth we made a really good attempt to hang out and grab some drinks after the show but that show's so busy like it's really hard to like and then the one day we finally thought we were gonna sync up we were at the wrong hotels <laughs> like Dave was like, I'm over here at this bar. Are you here? I'm like, yeah. And then he's like, well, I'm at this bar. I'm like, oh, shit. He's at the wrong. I'm like, one of us is at the wrong bar. And then I'm like, well, I guess it's not happening tonight because I don't want I was like. I think it was just like, are you going to the hotel bar? Yeah. And then we assumed we were both at the same hotel. I went to the one right next to the convention hall. I think we had established earlier in the weekend that we, we both thought we were staying at the same hotel. Yeah. So then when we made plans, it was just like, oh, are you going to be in the hotel bar later on tonight? Then we can get together. And then it did. Yeah. Like, we'll hey, we'll, we'll resolve this it bar. this year. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hanging out at this bar. I don't see you. Pretty much. Yeah. I, I mean, like, they, well, I I'm here. I'm like, I'm by the fountain. I'm like, fountain? There's no fountain in this bar. That's where, so yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever was there, I was just like, that's not at this bar. And I'm just like, well, mm. then I, because I remember I was with Sean Murray. And I was like, dude, we're at the wrong bar. And then Sean's like, just tell him to come over here. I'm like, no, he's the, he's already drinking over there. You know, like, it was a clusterfuck. Let's just call it what it is. Um, but we'll try this year. I think San Diego's back is what I'm hearing. So. I don't know that I'll be there, but. There's no dates, though. They haven't oh, done. Really? Oh, they still haven't. So there. what I've heard is they're, they're, they're supposed to come back. Oh, I hear a slight echo. Does anyone else hear an echo? If you can, but it's, or you just need to turn your speakers down a little bit. That might do the trick. Oh, wow, look at that. I was going to say, I, I hear a very slight little, not even echo, it's, it's just like little audio thing. Can you still hear us, but, David? Can you hear us? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good. I was going to say is, uh, what I heard was is San Diego is back. Cause like, you know, um, Ron had told me we're going to, we had a, we had a re-up. They said you have to re-up before yeah. the end of like last week. But then they haven't given us dates, so we don't know. Like, they the according are. to you their know their website has specific dates on it, but those are not yeah. conf- those are not confirmed, is what I'm hearing. Oh, which makes so no like, sense to me. July like, 21st to 24th is not confirmed yet. I would guess so, that that's supposedly that is the actual dates, but no one is saying that is the actual dates. <laughs> I want to book no. a. T- I got to book my flights, right? I got to book a flight. Yeah, I, I doubt Airbnb. I doubt that they would do a switch at the last minute if they are. I don't think they will. There's such a big show. But um, let's get back to Mouse Guard. I want to talk about Mouse Guard. Um, okay. Yeah. Because that's what. <laughs> that's why I want to get you on the show and talk about. It. So like, I know a lot of the story because you and I have hung out enough times to hear uh-huh. some. But I want you to tell the audience. Like, I would like you know, like, kind of how like it came to be. I guess because I you know like you have yeah. this cool like backstory on your friends and. The idea behind it and then how you formed it so you don't have to tell us the whole thing obviously but as much as you want to i think it's interesting for people to hear about how these ideas come into artists minds yeah in the beginning I'm curious about it. in the beginning <laughs> dark, it was a dark um, time <laughs> so i i mean i like talking animal stories um you know i was a fan of like wind in the willows and aesop's fables and disney's robin hood and stuff like that um and in high school i came up with the idea of doing like a medieval fantasy thing uh, that was probably a lot more like Disney's Robin Hood than it was 
what people think of as mouse guard. Mm -hmm. um, it had like it had a fox, it had a tiger, it had a bear, it had rabbits, it had you know all kinds of species. Actually, it had no mice at the time. Um, and I never, I never finished it. I'm being joined by a second dog. Um, nice. They're all joining the party. What else you got in there? <laughs> which means one, one is leaving, and now the door is wide open. Hold on, just a sec. Sure, sure. We're gonna get like a bunch of mice coming in, and then a bird. <clears throat> just, just like the dogs are just constantly gonna go in and out. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think the one that's out in the hall is gonna come right back through that door in a second. Um, so, you know, it's high school, so nothing really gets accomplished. Uh, and in college, I thought about dusting the idea off again, but I wanted it to make it more like, um, I, I felt like the kind of cartoony nature of the way I had drawn the characters in high school with, you know, kind of human-esque bodies and animal heads, um, was, was too childlike. That was too silly. That was too cartoonish. Right. And I wanted to do something... More like a, a, a Aesop's Fables kind of a thing, where the animals are actually animals. All the appropriate predator-prey relationships are still in place. Um, and I could even do it kind of like how Tolkien treated races uh, for each species. That each species would have its own language, its own culture. Mm -hmm. um, there's you know backstory about this group not getting along with that group. Except instead of just being elves, dwarves, men, halflings... It would be uh, foxes, badgers, geese, bears, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for every species, which is crazy daunting. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, to start trying to, like, frame that in, I was like, well, what's the largest thing I would include as a, as a character and what's the smallest? <laughs> um, and I thought the largest would be, like, a, a brown bear and the smallest would be a mouse. I didn't want to go into, like, insects and stuff have them as characters yeah. and then i i realized like oh there's going to be a problem with how do you keep small characters like mice or rabbits or things like that that are pretty low on the food chain overall how do you keep them involved in the story you know like when when the when the hobbits are ready to leave the shire and become you know part of the larger world yeah the rest of the the rest of the races kind of shake their heads at them like, oh, little hobbit, you can't accomplish anything. And, you know, mice yeah. would be like that, too, except also all those groups are going, mm, lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, boy, it's going to take a lot of it's going to take a lot of uh, clever writing so that there's always a reason that the fox needs to keep the mouse alive so that they can go be a, you know, go be a traveling D&D &D party. Um, right. I didn't want to do that, like, kind of you know, vegetarian vampire uh, <laughs> style of like, oh, well, they just choose not to. I'll make an exception for you, or I'm the one fox that doesn't eat meat, or what, you know, it was like, right. eh, yeah. I don't want I don't want to do that. So it meant that I, I had to start coming up with a uh, like a culture of how would something small like mice keep their society going. Um, and I just focused on them. And came up with all this stuff about this uh, this group, of, you know, mice building their cities hidden, and this uh, this group of mice called the Mouse Guard that travel between all the little hidden cities that help act as escorts and 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 patrol and make sure that predators aren't setting up uh, uh, you know dens and and burrows and stuff right next to where a mouse city is, and uh, and this little traveling group of mouse rangers would be called the Mouse Guard. And then it was like, I don't really need the rest other than his backdrop. We don't need, like, once we've found out about the plight of the mouse, is there anything compelling about the plight of the fox? <clears throat> sure. Yeah. Hmm. Nobody, nobody cares about the fox. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, eh. So, yeah, so that's how I, that's where the idea came from. And then I, um, I, sat on it for a number of years, uh, partly because I was still in college. And when you're in college, sure. you're supposed to be doing college stuff. Right. Um, I didn't have to kind of start a career. I was <laughs> trying, trying to graduate and, you know. You're perfecting your uh, keg stands. <laughs> no, I wasn't that guy. That was never, yeah. Or whatever it's but called. Yeah, just, yeah, and just not burn out. It was really the thing. Um, sure. So... 
yeah there was so college was one of the reasons i didn't get started on it once i had the like the idea um and the other reason was that there was a book series called Redwall that a friend yeah. of mine turned mm-hmm. me on to and was like oh check this out you'd love it it's about talking mice and uh, then i was like oh crap this is really good <laughs> i don't have <laughs> anything i don't have anything more to offer and it took probably about nine years between when I first had the idea and when I started working on the the first issue of Mouse Guard, so that I felt like uh, I had enough time to sit up, sit and think about it, and obviously do other things like graduate school and get my life settled and stuff like that. But um, but before I had the confidence to go, no, 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 I, I think I have something else to say besides what Brian Jakes said. I think I think I do have something unique to tell and do here. Sure. Um, and that I'm just part of this, you know, larger, richer tapestry of talking animal stories and many of them having to do with mice. But did it think... ever? Um, I remember you mentioned Redwall stuff before, and I was always wondering, like, I'm sure it irked you if somebody compares Mouse Guard to Redwall. It, in the very beginning, it did. Um, because in my mind, what that meant was people were saying you didn't have an original idea. Mm-hmm. They were yeah. saying, "Oh, this is just like, oh, this is just like Redwall," because that's how they'd phrase it. Oh, this is just like Redwall, right. and they weren't saying it like, "Oh, this is really cool, like Redwall." In right. my head, they were saying it of like, "Oh, it's just Redwall, just drawn like a comic by this idiot." Right. Um, I think after took, years, you start hearing it differently. It took. It just took a while to realize that the people who were fans of Redwall are going to be fans of mouse guard. And when mm-hmm. they compare it mm-hmm. uh, and don't say something like, Oh, it's a Redwall knockoff or it's just Redwall again or something like that. Like if they say, Oh, it's like Redwall," and there's that excitement in their voice. They mean like, it's oh, like I the like thing it. I like. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It took me a long time Maybe to get that from people. Positive. Yeah. But initially when you hear it, like people always say myself looks like destiny. And initially I'd be like, cool whatever thanks yeah. you know but then nowadays when i hear them tell, i can see like you can tell just by looking at the person saying it you'd be like this person is excited yeah. so they, they're excited and it, yeah. it reminds them of something they really like so you're like yeah. okay cool but it takes took me a little bit of time to yeah think that way i guess that's cool man i mean also you know i remember you mentioned a story i don't know if you want to talk about your friends like your characters are based on some of your best friends, right? Mm-hmm. Which is kind of cool, I think, because if your friends find out, they're like, you made me that guy? You know, like... <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, nobody's mad. Uh, nobody's been mad. Uh, they they like what, I, what I've done uh, in terms of representing them. Sure. Um, yeah, no, I, I... Even back when I was... This is like probably right when I was graduating high school <laughs> or getting into college... And, and wanting to do more creative writing. Um, like I did in high school, I did, and even in middle school, I did lots of like coming up with stories and coming up with characters or coming up with, you know, what we would now call like IP. But um, very little of it was ever written down, especially in like a, a, a narrative sense. Sure. You know, it was more, it was more like a conceptual a bunch hey, of little ideas. A, yeah, you'd say like, yeah. well, I've got a story, but you don't really have a story. You have a concept for kind of where a story could be. It's 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 the loosest framework of like a, a role-playing um, setting rather than an adventure. Yeah. Um, but when I was making that high school to college transition, mm-hmm. I was wanting to do more of like actually trying to tighten that stuff up and do some story work. Uh, and I, I had remembered that, and I was really unconfident in my writing abilities. And I had seen an interview with Frank Oz where he talked about the Muppets. Um, and he talked about how none of those characters work in a vacuum. Uh, that, like, Kermit all by himself. I mean, obviously, once we get to know the characters, you can do scenes with Kermit all by himself and we still respond. But... Kermit all by himself doesn't work as well as exasperated Kermit, who is the, you know, the foundation trying to get everything still working behind the scenes of the Muppet show while, you know, Gonzo's up to his weird stuff. Piggy's doing her, uh, her, her, uh, right. diva, diva act and, you know, scooters the, being the straight man against it all. 
Right. And then, and vice versa, no matter which characters you're talking about, like they only work because they're bouncing off of the reaction of the yeah, other characters. That's true. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'm not a good enough writer to be able to write all these kind of clever character, you know, designs for who, who reacts which way off of which one. So I was like, I'll just base some of these on character interactions that I know really well. So I base them on friends, but not just like, it wasn't just like a straight, oh, I'm going to make this guy or this mm -hmm. character, my friend Jesse, or this character, my friend Emerson. It was also, we had all played role-playing games enough that I knew kind of these these tropes uh, and exaggerated versions of ourselves that we, we tended to play in role-playing games. And that also meant that I, I got to witness lots of us bouncing off of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing seeing how one reacts to the other and i i love the idea that um like good character stuff is where two characters have the same end goal but different means of getting there and they disagree drastically in how to get there either through their approach or their uh the, the, like the actual path or just no we need to do it but quiet no we need to do it but loud you know yeah yeah um i got i got players like that in my campaign <laughs> Yeah, it's and it it makes as long as it doesn't bring things all the way to a screeching halt, um, it's fun. It's fun to have that that back and forth. And so it's like, well, I know those characters, whether they're the actual real us or they're the exaggerated kind of role playing game versions. Sure. Um, and I was like, I'll just I'll base the main characters on on that so that I understand exactly how to write them in almost any situation. I think that's brilliant. That's yeah. a cool way of doing it. Because, like, it for anyone who's read the series, you know, each of those characters has their own, like, attitudes. Which, once you read enough of it, you're like, you know exactly what those characters are going to, how they're going to react in any situation, for the most part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so you start off, and, and I'm, I'm wanting to give them more depth. Like, you never want a character to become so two-dimensional that... You know, it's just like they can be boiled mm -hmm. down to only that. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this is the angry guy. This is right. the... Yeah. They this guy just casts spells all day. Like, That's all he does. Well-rounded characters. Yeah you, need, yeah, you need to do some more stuff to to make them more well-rounded. So, um, but it's an additive process. Like, no no character, you know, in any other, in any other uh, media that you consume, books or movies, video games, whatever, um, no character comes out, like, fully formed. Uh, at the at the you know first moment of introduction, like we, sure. we get to know these characters, we get to see the experiences that maybe make them more humble, or where we do find out that that hidden little secret of you know wait the gruff guy also likes to go antiquing or you know whatever it <laughs> yeah. is. Yeah, um, grow with them slowly. Yeah, and so as a as a writer, you need to start with that kind of base archetype thing. What's the what's the first thing you want to get across to the audience about this character? Yeah. And then once you get them used to that, you can start adding more layers and giving more depth and I always think about that with like TV TV shows are very emblematic of that kind of thing. Like you think about like look at Star Trek Next Generation like season one compared to like later seasons. Like those characters are so paper thin They're in rough. terms of yeah, in terms of their personality traits, like a lot of the stuff that people kind of remember of the characters isn't doesn't really come about until like maybe season three is when they really start to become more well rounded than just the cutouts that they were at the beginning. A show like Deep Space Nine is a little different, but on sitcom, they, yeah, uh, the problem there is they start off, you know, like if you watch season ones of a lot of sitcoms. Nobody really knows who those characters are yet. Not, I mean, including the actors. Like, they're still finding yeah, their footing. The right. writers are still finding their footing. The audience still doesn't completely know. And then they get into a pretty good, like, okay, that's where they become themselves. But then if you go, like, one or maybe two seasons after where they really found their footing, it goes back to being 2D. Um, it's and simplified so because it's like, well, this is the, like... This is the joke with Kramer that we need to tell. This is the yeah. they become these exaggerated cartoon versions. It's almost like a parody of themselves. It's you know. the Homer Simpson problem. Like season one or whatever, very like 
standard guy, like kind of like nothing crazy yeah. about him whatsoever. And then just gradually they kept adding more and more. And I think around, uh, I think around like the Grimes episode when like he has the coworker named Grimes, that's when pe most people consider like Homer's character peaked. And like after that, it's like, you oh, really, really? Can't do anything else. Yeah. They, they consider like at that point, that's when the show shifted from here's a very believable guy that gets himself into like weird situations to where this is a guy that is so outlandish and at, like the universe bends around him as a result. That's, that's a good, I mean, that's a good way of looking at it. Cause I remember early on Simpsons was always supposed to be their main focus initially was supposed to be Bart. And then they were like, yeah. nobody really seemed to care about the kid. Cause it's like everyone's seen Dennis the Menace and, you know, I think there was also there was backlash at the time. I remember there were parents who didn't like the idea of idealizing a, a child. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> idealizing a kid who was an under a, a, like a known underachiever, a known right. You know, slap in the face to authority, etc. When it's an adult doing it, it's eh. it's a little different. You know, like it, where they it's they, irreverent. They, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's simply irreverent as opposed to being like, you know, uh, uh, warping. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> That's I, mean, bad I mean, upbringing. I mean, they did fine with moving to Homer as well. Yeah. They're on like season like twenty two or something. Um, oh, I, th I think it's higher than that now. Uh, I stopped watching it. It's, it's like I want to say it's in the thirties. That's ridiculous. I, 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 haven't, I haven't seen it in years, but I think it's around in the thirties. I stopped after like Conan left the show, and then the writing just kind of wasn't. Doing I don't it think me. I've seen an episode of The Simpsons since I was in high school. Yeah, that's probably about right. <laughs> It was it was there, the mid, early mid nineties. The last time I, mean, I, I watched it episode. when it was on DVD for a minute, and then I was like, mm -mm. like I tried to get my wife to watch some. I said after ten, just stop. I think t season ten is when Conan left the show, and then it just didn't feel as funny, which kind of told me that that dude had something special for all those seasons from like four to ten. Um, I was gonna say, I mean, he wrote the monorail episode. That's a gold brilliant. standard of writing. <laughs> it's brilliant writing. Um, I want to also touch base about the movie uh, Mouse Guard potential. There was a potential Mouse Guard movie, which, <laughs> I mean, the the teaser is still out there. I think it looks yeah. amazing. Um, yeah. I was hoping that, someday. That test footage is so good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember seeing that like get, like if when it finally leaked, I was like totally floored by this little tech demo done in Unreal. I was like, this is amazing. And then uh, I forget the studio that worked on it. Uh, but seeing all their concept art and like maquettes and stuff, those, those were just yeah. top notch stuff. The stuff that, and to anybody who like right now is going and looking up that footage and looking at it, um, the stuff when it was released, that stuff had been around for over a year. Um, like that was early concept, proof of concept stuff. Oh, yeah. Was, it's like, yeah, and it's it was not like it, fully rendered anything. Not even, not even like, oh, it's not fully rendered. Like, they were still like there wasn't a I don't think there was a finished script, a finished shooting script at the point that that stuff was put together. That was the director basically going, I want to film a bunch of stuff to kind of show that we can do this. I want to show different kinds of shots. I want to show like mice riding birds. I want to show mice fighting. I want to show kind of softer, tender moments. I want to show I have this idea in my head that I want to do. Um so that, that was like the sizzle and reel kind of thing. It was, that it's, was it, that was around. sizzle reel. That was yeah, a, that's the way to that's say. That's exactly yeah. what it was called the sizzle. It wasn't didn't need to be shopped around. It was already at Fox. Um, okay. And part of it was to show the Fox execs like, hey, this is not so much the story, the final look, the whatever. This when you watch this, you will under understand exactly the tone and mood of what we're going for. Right. So and also like if you go back and watch the. The like Lord of the Rings, um, you know, behind the scenes making of kind of featurettes. There are those shots of the previs that are essentially like moving storyboards mm -hmm. of like the fellowship running through Moria, right? And they looked, re it was all gray. Yeah. It looked very like old video game ish. The it's very rough. For, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, you yeah. can tell, like, oh, those are the characters. They were more than, like, you know, balls and sticks kind of figures moving through things. But it was it was rough. This is what that was for us. This was the director going, I'm going to use this Unreal technology to um, 
plan out how we're going to actually film these these moments. This was our previs. This was the like, let's see how these shots are working. Because when you're doing motion capture, also like, you'll have the actor perform the thing on stage, and while the director might be there you know, technically with a, a virtual camera kind of filming where he thinks he's going to get his shots. The motion capture means that that performance has been captured already from every angle. So then once it's in like a previous stage, mm -hmm. he can then choose all the shots, all the angles, all the cuts, and he can cut that scene up into close-ups and this and that, all using the same performance without having to have anybody come back in. Um, so having that data was then allowing him to go, here's a close-up, here's a this, here's a fast shot, here's a slow shot, mm -hmm. here's, a, here's a whatever. Um, and because Weta was going to be ultimately doing the final versions of the mice, um, the director's team kind of stopped doing work on the, the mouse designs, mm -hmm. uh, virtu the, the 3D versions of the mouse sure, design. Sure, sure. Like, they were doing concept art and stuff like that, but at some point they're just like, all right, it's not worth our time to get in here and noodle around because ultimately it's going to be right. another company. All we need is a mouse-shaped thing to move through this scene. So some people are like, oh, I don't like the look of the mice. Or some people say like, well, they're not rendered. Maybe they look better when they're rendered. Like, those weren't the mice. <laughs> right, yeah. Those, those were moving mannequins. I think it looked yeah. good. I don't like Yeah, it. and they still looked great. They yeah, still looked they great. They still looked good. It's funny to me how nitpicky people are about little things like that without like just doing a little bit of extra like research to be like, oh, well, this is this is not fully done. This is just the like proof I, of concept. I mean, I'm sure you guys have 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 had this right. Like, there's something that you like, and and of course, both being creative people, there's that too. Uh, like, there's something that you like, and then you either go see the book, you go see the movie, or you watch the TV show or whatever, and in your head you're you're going, it's not how I would have done this. Sure. Yeah. I think, in fact, I think the way I would have done this would have been better. <laughs> the vision I have for how this should have been done would have been better the way I have it in my head than what they did. So I think there are a lot of people that, having read my books, have a vision in their head of what Mouse Guard is supposed to look like. And it varies like sure. crazy. Um, there are people who want this to be... Uh, like Secret of Nim, hand drawn Don Blue Oof. style animation. There are people who want this to be uh, Kubo and the uh, Ooh, two strings, yeah, yeah. stop motion kind of stuff. There are people who want it to be, you know, if, if it's CG, they have every mouse from Stuart Little to Reaper Cheap to <laughs> the, the animals in, in um, or, or really stylized stuff like Madagascar, or things like that. Like everybody's got a version in their head. And a lot of times they also go, well, I want it to look just like your drawings. And I'm like, yeah, it's all, it was always going to be a translation. So sure. I wanted it to be yeah. a translation that made sense for the medium. And these characters need to move and need to act and need to emote <laughs> totally different than the way I have them on the page. So they are going to get like slightly more humanized in their facial expressions. They're going to get yeah. slightly more humanized mm -hmm. in their, in their like leg stance. Um, and I'm okay with that. But yeah, people got real nitpicky and some of it was about the technical stuff, but some of it was also, they had a, they had a version of what a mouse guard movie was in their head. And this wasn't, and, and everybody's version was different, which means that this also wasn't their, anybody's version. Sure. But yeah. Hmm. But I would say most people were excited and then disappointed that it ended up not happening. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the mocap earlier. Was that a? Do you know if it was um, if they're using a virtual camera thing for that then to like stage their shots and set that up? I, I don't yeah. remember if that tech was available at that time. Yeah, yeah. The director had a had a virtual camera that they could use, but the the sensors were in the ceiling of the soundstage. Okay. Oh, cool. So it wasn't the camera capturing the data. The camera was essentially just another mocap. Like right, it was just establishing like, hey, a shot. Basically, it, it was it was telling the computer that was then rendering all the all the data. This is the direction I want you to be looking. Mm -hmm. That's this cool. is the depth of focus I want you to show. It was that kind of stuff, um, and it was it was just getting recorded 
like, you know, like another performance. Here's the performance of the camera. But uh, he could also go in and do, after the fact, like do reverse angles and do all kinds of, you know, top down, this and yeah, that, so without having so to read. captured like the yeah. whole 360. That's the, do whatever. Yes. This is the tech that they use like on like Avatar and stuff was like one of the earliest mm -hmm. ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. Avatar, yeah. Uh, Rango is probably the closest comparison for this because oh. that was like okay. full 3D, but they did it like all the actors were mo and they all acted out their parts during it. Like they had Johnny Depp on the set with, I forget the other character actors, Bill Nagy, I think was in there or whatever. Um, yeah, they did it for that, like same kind of thing, like directors holding the camera and he's doing his shots or whatever. And all the char all the other actors are just doing their thing yeah. within the scene. That's yep. cool. There was also a, um, Oh, Beowulf too. Yeah, they had virtual, oh, yeah. Uh, like VR sets that mm. people could wear too, so that you could be in the environment and walk around and see it. Did you do that? Uh, I did. They didn't have it set up. They were oh. showing me how they could do it. Got um, it. I think with the when I think when I was there, they had a a, a big like giant size screen up. And then he moved the virtual camera around the soundstage just to kind of show, like, look, I'm looking down at the ground. And then on the TV, you can see yeah, on the screen, cool, you can see, like, oh, that's the terrain of the floor. And over here, and then, you know, he'd have, like, maybe some tape on the floor to show, like, this is where that rock is so that nobody walks through the rock. Um, and there was stuff like that. But the the virtual reality stuff was so that, like, once we... if. <laughs> Once we or if we had gotten to that point, you know, the cast could have like wandered that space. They could have sure. they could have really immersed themselves in this is where I am. Yeah. This is what this look looks like just before the scene, then taken off the, the goggles, gone into the regular mocap <laughs> gear and just done a, a performance with the other the other actors. But um, someday, yeah. maybe Who someday, knows? maybe uh, rights are tied up. Um, once uh, once they started filming, because we did start, uh, we did three days of filming with Giancarlo Esposito. Oh, really? Um, I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> Dang. Man. So Wes, Wes Ball was the director. He directed um, the Maze Runner series. Mm -hmm. And so he knew, he, he always called Giancarlo his like, his good luck charm or his something, there was something like that. Like, you're, you're my lucky actor or something like that. So um, he just, he was like, I've got this smaller part of this one mouse that I think would be great for you. Do you want to come in and do it? And it's early, it's a scene earlier in the movie. So he was like, let's just bring him in. Let's start filming. And then we'll learn a little bit from that. And then wait, I think it was like a month and a half or two months. And then the full cast was coming in to start like the honest to goodness principal photography, um, as it were. And uh, yeah, so we filmed like two or three days with Giancarlo and it was during that gap it was about a week before the you know full cast was set to arrive that disney sure. uh because it was it was set up it was set up at fox the merger had been rumored for a long time and then the merger finally went through like all the you know all the federal level approvals for right can this company acquire another is there any antitrust or any you know et cetera et cetera problems um uh so they it got approved and then i would say within a month of that was when disney went yep this is canceled which it was hard not to take personally right um and i know that there you know there are people who are like oh disney won't let there be more than one mouse or it's because it's mice yeah, I, yeah we don't completely know sure there could be some of that i th i think the two biggest reasons for the cancellation is anytime one company acquires another if there is a chance to cancel any deal that hasn't yeah. like started yet mm -hmm. you do it because you want your people to have made that deal you want your company's boilerplate yeah. to be all the legal stuff you know mm -hmm. fox fox made a deal with me in terms of some of the back end and stuff like that that i don't think disney would ever have done and i don't think that I, and, and when I say that, I don't mean that Disney looked at this contract or anything and went, whoa, I think that it's just standard procedure, no matter what industry you're in. Yeah. That yeah, if like you're acquiring a company, 
if you're acquiring a company, you get rid of the other company's contract, uh, le legal boilerplate contract, sure. and replace it with yours ASAP, which means canceling contracts yeah. that are still out there. Yeah. Um, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff got killed and canceled. West Side Story with Spielberg is, I think, one of the only ones that made it through from what was kind of in production or in development. And that's, and that's, because, of the name. And that's because it's Spielberg. And, yeah, and I actually... Spielberg. Uh, it was on the chopping block, and I've actually heard a really great that I can't share story about kind of how Spielberg. Uh, uh, Can you tell us later? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Maybe sure. Uh, yeah, how he how he he made it a little harder for Disney to say no. I mean, the dude's but, that dude's been in the industry for so long. He's like, you're not killing my project. You know. So there's. I, I remember. I remember. Uh, X-Men New Mutants apparently had a very troubled production because of that kind of thing. Like Disney wanted to just drop it because of, yeah. it was already... They reshot that film everything. like 10 times. Well, and it was... There it was, was that and then all by the time stuff where it's like they, by the time, they couldn't drop it. By the time Disney yeah. like had full control and ownership, I think it was done. Like I think it had been. Yeah, they they had like some minor reshoots. They were in like they yeah, they were in like fi yeah, they were in like final edits. So it was just you know pickup shot reshoots, not like I don't think the reshoots at that time were. Oh, we drastically have to change the story. Reshoots. I think they were, but uh, maybe I'm, maybe I don't. Yeah, anyway, it, that one that one was more like, man, eh, we don't really want to do anything with this, but we got to just release it to release it. Yeah. Um, Mouse guard I mean, wasn't far enough along that they had to do that. So that's one thing is like you know just any any country any company is going to try to get rid of the old company's contracts. Um, the other thing I think is if they're going to spend money on a, a realistically shot 3D mocap talking animal thing, it's in Disney's interests to do Disney's Robin Hood or the Rescuers or Sword in the Stone or any one of their past animated features. Um, because that strengthens the Disney brand. That strengthens things that are already in the parks. That strengthens things that they already have. You know, like, it, I know that people complained about the uh, the Aladdin redo. I mean, the people complained about the you know all the redos, but I remember what, especially when the Aladdin one came out, there was like, oh, boy, that wasn't any good. Tell you what yeah. I'm going to do, though. I'm going to show my kids the original version. So it's like, yeah. even though even though maybe the new one isn't great for Disney, it resells the old one. Mm -hmm. You know, like it it just reinforces it. it there was. It, yeah. It, Those so ones are rough, with Mouse man. Guard, the only thing it was, I mean. Obviously, they make money on on sales of Mouse Guard, and they were going to be they would be able to do Mouse Guard merch and everything. But um, you know, it was really going to help me sell books more than it was going to help them sell anything other than their own movie. Yeah, you would have gotten the the sweet deal out right. of it versus them, right? So why why do that when you could just reinforce things within your own scope? I think they I think those are the two reasons. Do they still have the film rights or did yes. that revert? Okay, they still do. I, I can never remember like what the rules are. Is it that, forever? Like, how long they can it, hold on to it. It's, no. it's not it's not forever and it well so it could have been. Sure. Um it, it actually could have been. In fact, it was kind of slated to be. Um and that was even before the Disney stuff came in. That was when it was still Fox that we um in, in doing the final negotiations. It, essentially it's there's there's kind of two stages of rights. There's option phase and then there's purchase phase. Um and generally a studio doesn't purchase the rights outright until they're ready to actually make a film. Because the paydays are much different. The option is nice money. Purchase is much better money. So they don't I mean every now and then a studio will just go, we're gonna buy the rights to this because either we know this is gonna work and we're gonna do it or we want this out we want this out of circulation we don't want anybody to be able to touch this but usually a studio will do that just for a, a small amount of time with like option payments once the purchase price has happened they they've purchased it right like if you want to do house terms it's you know if you're if you're selling your house and somebody comes by and goes i don't want you to sell your house to anybody else yet so I'm going to give you this amount of money as an op, you know, I'm going to option your house. And uh, all I want you to do is take it off the market. Don't sell it to anybody for this amount of time. And then actually at the end of that time, I'll come back and I might offer you some more option money. Right. 
And then you do that for a certain amount of time. All the option time periods eventually expire. And then they either say, okay, here's the final. Now we're buying your house or Meh, we're good. And now you can put your house back on the market. But once they purchase the house, like if you sell your house to somebody, it's their it's house theirs. now. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of how the the base level stuff for movie or the, you know, like base contract concepts work for, for movie stuff. We put in a clause that um, if, if there wasn't a sequel within seven years, the rights reverted. Um, and mm. what we were really guarding against was what if they make one and it's really bad, whether it's really bad, like quality wise, or maybe it's the best movie ever. Just it was bad financially. Mm -hmm. Like it just didn't do well. Mm -hmm. Like, well, we don't want then the rights to forever be tied up where that studio doesn't want to do something with it, you know, five, yeah. 10 years down the road. So we were like, let's put in a seven year clause where they don't get the rights forever unless they do at least two, which also means I get paid twice if it's, if it's two. Um, which also, like, now it sounds like if they don't make... They've not made a first movie, so if they don't make right. a second one in seven years... Exactly. The rights yes. will revert back. There's, I mean, there's other kind of, you know, loophole stipulations sure, sure. Stuff that's going to need to get... But, yeah. Um, and, and quite honestly, I would much rather... I want to do the version that we were working on. Right. And if the rights revert, all the development work... It's, it's belongs still there. To Fox, well, it belongs to Fox Disney. Oh yeah, they bought Fox. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but that's what I mean. Like that. So when you're adapting a book, there's problems that have to be solved because this is a movie and not a book. How are mm -hmm. we going to get this character introduced earlier? How are we going to, you know, cement this idea? How are we going to get past this weird um, plot hole that David wrote into his books? Things like that, right? Like you come up with these these better solutions for the movie for story stuff. And to get the get the audience understanding who those characters or who the relationships are much faster. Um, and we came up with all these solutions for that. But while I own, like once the rights revert, I own the movie rights for what's in my book. The solution, solutions, the yeah. solutions we chose belong to them. And so we would need to fix those problems in specifically different ways. <laughs> different this from the original solution. Different, different so from the original solution, right. which then is like, well, now this is like maybe your second best solution for how to fix this. And right. there's there's a possibility that, you know, uh, another studio who would want to move forward in that amount of time would say, hey, we're willing to buy, like, in addition to, to getting the rights, um, which would be open, but there's some reimbursement that would need to happen. Like in, yeah. in, in addition to reimbursing you what you paid for this, um, we also want to buy the development. Right. Uh, so. Oh, and okay. So that's an option, but you know, that's a negotiation. Just like if you saw something on somebody's property, you really liked and you just walked up and knocked on the right. door and it's like, how much will you sell me that thing for? How much will you sell me your wind chime for? <laughs> it reminds yeah. me of, um, Ian McKay has a great story about this. Uh, John Carter of Mars was in production hell for so long that Ian yeah. McKeg actually got tapped, I think, three separate times to design the Tharks for yeah. three different companies. So each time it had to be a completely different take mm -hmm. than what he was working on before. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I know I know even just from comics and stuff that, that there are there it's innate that there are within editors and, and companies that are going to publish stuff, um, the desire to put your thumbprint on things, or even if you're just, if you're editing and helping to shepherd that you're like, I think those things need to be taller and more scary. I think those, I think yeah. these creatures need to be softer. Oh, I think we, I think the tone was totally wrong. I, I think this whole thing needs to be, uh, uh, more humorous or, you know, like, yeah. and everybody wants to put their thumbprint and it's not that that's a necessarily a bad thing. A lot of times that's an editor doing their job and shepherding something the way that their vision then overlaps with whatever the creative team's decisions are as well. So the idea that those creatures got designed three different times, like in some ways you're like, Oh, that's stupid. But in other ways, it's like, that's kind of the nature of, 
Yeah, it's it's yeah. expected with like especially there's like three different film studios that each touched yeah. John Carter before it finally ended on Disney. It's just funny that each time they turned to like, oh, we're going to hire Ian. Ian McKay, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, why wouldn't you, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, yeah, obviously pick him, but my God, I'm sure he was like, by the third one, he's like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> I can't get in tap for this. Yeah. I mean, he, he's good at what he does, so they probably keep calling him yeah. back in over and over, and then... Uh, that's well, probably I, exactly why they, they tapped him for it. I see... Uh, I would be terrible with that. I see other comic book artists that put out... Um, when they show like their their process for like doing a cover, or especially if it's a, a cover for another company, like a variant cover or something like that, they will they will send the the editor like maybe five or six thumbnails of possibilities of what the cover should be, and then start you know working on the one that gets picked. I only ever send somebody one, mm. and it and it's already pretty tight when I send it to them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's it's still in a stage where if they ask for changes, okay. Um, but I'm like, I, I've already internally winnowed down what you those, want those ideas to be the one I'm the most interested in. Was, like, especially when you're, like that's yeah. a smart play to do oh, it. The company I was, accepts I was say, it. Like, how many how many internal iterations do you do before you deliver that one? You're like, this is the one for yourself. Is it? You a, a decent amount, or is it like what do you, no, what do you, what do you say? No, it's usually it's usually pretty quick. So, um, I think I tend to think, um, I I tend to think about it more than I tend to draw. Like I almost think through the thumbnails rather than drawing them. Right. It's it's the thing of like, okay, how many characters need to be on this cover, or what what's the what's the theme of this cover? Is it a scary cover? Is it a humorous cover? Is it a, you know, is it a chase scene? Is it a pond, a contemplative scene? Whatever it is. And then how many characters need to go on this? And then with a cover, like in interiors, it's okay to show the back of a character because a couple panels later, you also get to do the reaction shot of their face and we'll get a, you know, we'll get right, a sense right. of both characters in the whole scene. But on a cover, showing a character from the back is really tricky. You kind of have to do it in like, either it's a mystery who they are or especially if it's a superhero, like they've got something on their back that makes it really clear who they are, like a, a you know, like a or pointed a ears or Bizarro or something, you know. Um, or it's it's the like three quarter but reverse, so we're still seeing part of their face. But I think about that, like wh what characters need to be in this? If it's multiple characters, how can I get away with them? Maybe both ultimately kind of facing towards camera, even if they're looking over shoulders or things mm -hmm. like that so once i've done that and and figured out how big or how small they can be and what the emotion is i just start drawing what's going to make the most sense based on those constraints um and i i tend to draw characters separately on copy paper and then digitally scan them and and start moving and sliding things around until i come up with a composition so there's the the play and figuring things out in that stage um, where I might even redraw a character and go like, no, nah, I've got this wrong. I gotta, I gotta, <laughs> like my concept is right, but I kind of drew it wrong now that I've played around and seen, I, I gotta, you know, I gotta draw them more rigid or I gotta draw them more action packed or whatever. But, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't like giving a lot of options because I feel it like how terrible would it be? Even if you gave them three options in your head, you already have which one you don't like of those three. Yeah. God forbid they pick that one. Now you're spending how they much time always in pick that one. working on always, working on a piece yeah. you hate. I always feel that way with thumbnails. Like especially if I if I feel like I've hit on the idea early on, and then it's like ah, you feel obligated to do the rest of the thumbnail. So it's like you don't. Your heart's not in it. You already figured out the one internally that you want to do. Yeah, I mean for <laughs> yourself that work. I mean like every so all the freelance I've done now. Anytime I submit it, I usually submit four. And I always, they're only slightly different from each other. So it's like, sometimes I just change the background. <laughs> I'm like, which one do you like the best? Let's go with that. Like I did some stuff recently where you've seen it, Andrew, with the worm mm -hmm. and all that, where I just basically changed the background. I didn't change too much on the character. Um, just enough to be like, I'll tweak it here just so it looks like it's moving a little different. And then they actually picked the one I like, thank God. But um, if you, yeah, I wish I could be like David and just submit one and be like, here's what you get. <laughs> 
like usually it, I'm working with comic companies that are like press for we time. know exactly like we know who you are right we're you know it's like I get when um and and also like it's the cover to an issue that already has interiors and has a story you know and that kind of thing so I think if I was doing work for a company where it's their IP and this is going to be the only, like if it's a card art for some game or something, you know, and this is going to be the only version in this set of the whatever of the, you know, Elven barbarian. I could totally get that. They're going to want to see some options because they're like, yeah, your first shot at the Elven barbarian is not what we're trying to get across. But when it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, David's doing seven, six or seven issues of Usagi Yojimbo and he turns in, you know, one thumbnail or not even thumbnail, like one penciled version for cover one. Yeah, it's sure. (laughs) He understands what Usagi is. It's one of six or seven. Um, We can still ask for subtle changes, but there's no doubt that like, I'm going to somehow miss the theme or miss the tone or miss the character design or whatever. So the notes are things like, Hey, can you, you know, can, can you raise this up a bit? We're worried about the type or can you uh, what's going on over here? It's a little unclear. It's it's clarity stuff. It's not. It's not. not drastic. Yeah, it's not big picture stuff. Speaking of Usagi, I was, I, one of my questions for you was going to be, can you name some of your favorite comic books? Like stuff that might have influenced you? Uh, yeah. Uh, Ninja Turtles were, were big. The Eastman and Laird stuff um, oh, from yeah. the 80s. Um, who's your favorite turtle? So Michelangelo, but everyone has their own like head cannon for who, the, cause there's been so many iterations. Yeah, I was going to say, who do you think you are? <laughs> yeah. I mean, not Michelangelo. I, I actually think we're, I think we're all, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think that's, I think that's kind of the basic idea behind it, right? Each of their personnel is a little bit of everyone. I think we're all, all of them. And, uh, and I, I am, a little bit of a Michelangelo, like I, so. The Michelangelo I see is also the the guy who, um, like all the laughs and stuff. It's not like he's a you know a clown. It's not the I am Pagliacci kind of thing. It's not like that. <laughs> but, I am the clown. Yeah, but there is but there is an element of like I, I always saw Michelangelo's humor and and lightheartedness as um dealing with the circumstances that they're under. Like, Raph and Leo the about to right? slit, slit each other's... Th- well, I don't know. I don't know if that was established in the comics that I was reading or not. Oh, I, I don't remember. Yeah. I always thought they were essentially the same age, but, um, you know, maybe, maybe they're older or younger by hours or minutes, but... Uh, but, yeah, I, I like, Raph and Leo are about to slit each other's throats at any given moment, and yeah. Michelangelo's like, hey, fart, fart sound... <laughs> if we're laughing we're not killing right right <laughs> um but not like oh, surf's up what's going on dude i don't even know like uh, that is not my michelangelo at that's all that's not how you imagine well that's if you read the comic books that's not how they really right right and it, i mean in the old comics it was all black and white too so you didn't yeah. know um I mean, and even once they were first colored, everybody had a red bandana. So you didn't know who was who if they weren't holding their weapon or being referred to. I remember as a kid flipping through an issue. It's where they're out on the farm. With and it's with like splinters missing, and um, there's this this part where like one of the turtles is is out in the barn, and there's a, a full size punching bag, and he's like he starts punching it, and then he starts kicking it. And he punches it so hard, the sand starts po- pouring out. And then he kicks it so hard, it breaks the chain and goes through the wall of the, you know, the barn. And he's just still, like, punching it when it's outside and sand is pouring from his hands. And then the, the caption is April going like, I think Michelangelo is taking it the hardest. He's just really good at hiding his feelings. Mm-hmm. And it was like, oh, that's not Raphael losing his shit on that punching bag. Wow, that's Michelangelo. So, yeah. yeah, they they were again. It's that thing going back to about characters being becoming like almost exaggerated caricatures of themselves. The you know the Michelangelo, or the Donatello being so smart he can make transdimensional portals out of things he finds in the sewer in an old Mac or an old <laughs> Commodore. 
And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and Raf being so angry, he he really, I mean, I joked earlier about wanting to slit each other's throats. It's, it's, it's like your friends or brothers in high school where you're really upset at them and you will like punch them hard or say something really mean or do something really cruel, but you weren't going to actually kill them. You know, right. I don't think Raph is a murderer, but yeah. when it gets exaggerated, he's just all the time angry, all the time murdery. Leo's just the wet blanket of like, Hey guys, we got to behave. Donatello's making science that humans and labs can't come up with <laughs> on his, <laughs> on, on his zero education and scavenged, uh, equipment. that man learned from reading books. I don't know how and he learned. Just that turtle learned, I mean. and like, Hey, I didn't screw up the whole mission. Right. Cause I brought pizza. Like, it's just, that's not who they are to me. Sure. Yeah, but yeah, eat. Ninja so Ninja Turtles uh, it was a was a big influence. Um I like the 70s era X-Men stuff. Oh yeah. Um, the giant size team mm. was kind of my team when I was growing up. Um even though that was after like I I was reading those in the 80s uh that were reprints. But it was the 70s team that really that really hit me. Um Hellboy is huge for me. Hellboy is huge for me too. Lock and Same. Key. Lock and Key's so good. Yeah. Yeah, I had a friend last week who just figured out that Joe Hill was Stephen King's son. Like, he didn't realize <laughs> that he changed his name. Like, that's not his real name, right? It might be Joe King. It I don't is know. Re- it is his real name. It's an abbreviated version. His 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 name is Joseph Hillstrom King. Ah, okay. So, like, yeah, I was like Joe Hill, and they're like, "Who's Joe Hill?" And like, that's Stephen yep. King's son. They were like, "What?" And then I said, "Lock." Yep. What's funny is like if you see the photo of him. He looks just like his dad. Yeah. (laughs) Well, in the early days when he was submitting, he wouldn't do anything in public. Um, And I think there was even an event where he sent like a a manager or publicist to do something for like a reading or something. Really? Um, Because he, I mean, he was, he hated the idea that people wouldn't judge him based on his own writing and just that he would either, he would get opportunities because of his famous dad and not because his like he was going to start getting works published not because of their own merit you know god forbid something terrible that he writes got in just because of the name um yeah, or that people would be over or that people would be overly critical um i mean compare him to his dad and he was like i just want to be i just want to be my own person so he tried to hide it at the very beginning I can see why, because like you said, right? You don't want to be compared to your dad, but it's just what's, I mean, that's just what's going to happen, unfortunately. Well, I mean, I think, so. I, I think in some ways it was smart. Like he did a really good job of, of establishing that work so that there was no denying the talent of what he was doing. Right. When you read, even his earliest, you know, his earliest novel, Heart Shaped Box, it's great. Mm-hmm. And it feels oh, kind of, one. It, and it feels kind of kingish, but also not. And yeah, he's so just then, just different enough. Like obviously, uh, yeah. some of his father's influences are going to be there. I mean, they're a family of storytellers, and they love stories, and they love talking about stories, and they love sitting around the table and reading stories to one another. Um, yeah, I imagine they're like so the, the inklings course, sitting around. Of course, that stuff is gonna you know concepts and ideas and worldviews on writing and what makes good stories are gonna are gonna rub off dude can you imagine if you were like a horror story and your dad's stephen king and you're like i got this cool idea for a horror story and your dad's like that's garbage let me show let me show you something scary <laughs> you know like, I, I could ah. easily see like oh stephen king's like i already wrote that though <laughs> yeah i wrote that 20 years ago try again um that's cool though yeah tmnt i mean you could see some of my funkos back there or some of my big, you know, I love. I don't TMNT. think it's. Yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, you got those. Those are the oh. the NECA ones, right? Yep. Those are so the full good. size. Yep. And just underneath, it's really hard to see them, but um, there was a NECA line that was made to look just like the the Eastman Laird drawings from. Yeah, the, like, from I saw those in San Diego. And there were the I. They made them in like a black and white, but they also did them in in a color where they all have red bandanas, and I have the those each turtle is underneath each turtle so it's like the that's cool. the little the little neca the little comic one is underneath the oh yeah 90s kind of, one. i want to get so like um you know at san diego I, yeah um 
uh, Dave Seeley is friends with um, Jason Eastman, whose cousins is Kevin Eastman, you know. Mm-hmm. So my brother-in-law, you sort of, long story short, my brother-in-law used to work for a theater and he has all the, he's got a giant tube full of posters from the original movie. Mm-hmm. Crisp. They're like mint condition. Just all, rolled up in oh, this wow. tube. All the nice and I, he showed it to me one day and I was like, whoa. So I immediately messaged Jason and I said, hey, what are the chances if I bought a couple of these in San Diego, you can get Kevin to sign some for me because that would be awesome to put up on. I'll get you one, David, if I do it. But uh, he was like, bring them. I'll get it done. Oh, cool. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. So, and I, I remember my brother was showing these to me and I was just like, why the flip do you have like 50 of these posters? Did you like rob a poster store or what's going on? And then he's like, I used to work at a theater and then yeah. that's how many they would get. They would get, you know, you're supposed to give them away, obviously. My brother-in-law right. obviously was like, I'm going to take these home with me. It's yeah. a fat tube, but they're in mint condition though. I was just like, that's cool. Awesome. If I Kevin's can. great. I've, I've met him several times. Um, he Sounds actually did like a blurb. Cool he did a blurb for my art book that was like, that meant everything to it was, and it was something really short, like one of my favorite artists on the planet or something like that. And I was That's like, enough oh, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I was reading those seventies X-Men at the time. And even though I could read the inside cover to know like who penciled this issue, you know, like, Oh, Dave Cockrum drew this one. And, uh, so and so inked it, or oh, now it's changed. Now this is the uh, John Byrne is drawing the X Men, or whatever. Like even though I knew there were creative teams, and Chris Claremont was writing those issues, even though I knew those names as a kid, there was something different about when I started reading Ninja Turtles, and some of it was like right over the title, Eastman and Laird's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and then you read those stories, and they're so like <laughs> so different. Yeah. That I was like, wait, Eastman, like, it's just these two dudes sitting around making shit up and then drawing it. Where I don't know what I thought Chris Claremont and Dave Cockham were doing that somehow wasn't that because they <laughs> like were high end. Exactly. You thought they were like high yeah. end, like. Well, almost like there's this crank and, you know, the Marvel machine is turning. Yeah, yeah. And X Men issues come out, and working inside that machine somewhere are Dave Cockrum and it's and, actual and, like Cerebro. They're actually putting on the helmet, right? <laughs> and deep diving it. But but <laughs> the idea, like, there was something just more like grassroots, visceral about those Ninja Turtle comics, where I was like, Pete and Kevin are like just chatting ideas, like my friends and I drew, I do, and then they're drawing them, and then they're publishing them. Like, there's no machine, there's no extra. Pieces. Yeah, there's nobody telling you you can't do that. It's just that. They're just making this. And I was like, I want that job. Like, that's a job to have. So they're the ones that kind of really got me to understand how comics were made and and that it really is just that pure, making stuff up and drawing it, um, sure. that made me want to do this. And then so for Kevin to you know, show up like a champ for me uh, when we needed a blurb, it's, it's great. Oh, it awesome. I mean, I think it's cool when, so like, uh, um, you know, when I was, when you and I first met, I was still working at Concepts for H01 stuff. And I think hanging out with like you and, and like, you know, my mentor, Sean Murray, like you guys really helped give me that extra push I need, honestly. Like I've got, you know, I, I had to go dig it out, but I got like all these notes. These are notes from David, by the way. Uh, when I first met you, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to keep it up on screen too long. I don't want anyone to read it. <laughs> But they're like notes, like you gave me good advice. Like, you know, it says things like don't make locations your backgrounds. And it says don't populate an area until you actually live in it. Like don't make locations your backgrounds. It says let characters live in them. Don't make them backgrounds. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, like, like, yeah, it shouldn't be just like a. a just a uh, place I yeah, randomly uh, name and then don't take it. Yeah, like a ever. theater flat. Right. 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 Yeah. And then, you, you know, you said don't populate it. You know, don't populate until you arrive you know, save the, save the history for like when they're there. So I have like all these little notes from David and on the other side is all these notes from Sean. Actually. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Like if you're doing world building stuff, I'm a big fan of the idea that um, unless you are specifically making something for a role playing, like unless you're doing a, a role playing game setting, like if right. you are responsible for a, an entire location, entire place that's supposed to be an open sandbox for people to play, you don't start, uh digging into 
all the backstory, history, what those cities are made, you know, who lives there, how does this part of their economy work, oh, this is the castle, it was destroyed in 1693, but then it was rebuilt on, you know, like, don't do that stuff until your characters are going there. You can have vague ideas like, oh, I want to do this city where there was like this castle that got rebuilt three, like three or four times. And there's this like whole dark history about who owned it when it was when it was there. But like, you know, who who owned which version of it? And, and maybe there's even like a claim to who's the rightful king of that place because so many different people had castles there. Like. Mm-hmm. And, and and that town is always, or that city is always kind of in turmoil. Like, that's as deep as you want to go. Right. That's it. Don't start coming up with names yeah. for those kings. Don't start coming up with which one was the good one and which three were the evil ones. Or who usurped who, or what the castle looked like, or what that did to the peasants. Or is, is, is it human kings, or is it elven kings? Was it a different race each time? Is that what it, Don't get into that crap until it's time for your characters to go there Mm -hmm. because otherwise you're going to end up making a role-playing game that has no story. Yeah. Um, I, I I had a friend who in high school and college when he would go like, Oh yeah, I'm I'm working on a a role-playing campaign for us. And he would have just notebooks full of backstory for this thing. And it was like, this isn't a campaign. The campaign is the choices our characters are making when you're narrating stuff to us about where we are and what the NPCs say, this is a setting. There's no story here. So you need just enough backdrop, just enough setting for your characters to play in, to actually do something. That's the story. To get them. Yeah. I I strongly agree with that. Um, I, I definitely know like, at least for me, I've talked with friends or whatever that are more on the other side where they're like, no, I got to build this whole thing up. And that's never been my bag. It's like, I don't, that's not interesting to me. I'd rather, as I get there, you know, fog yeah. of war kind of thing, I, I'll flesh it out. Does that also go when you're figuring out, like, planning how far in advance for stories? Like, is that the same kind of tact you take where it's like, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it? Or do you plan out a little bit more advanced? Um, no, I, I tend to be a big picture outline person until, until I get there. Um, like when I, when I start a book, I will make an outline of all the things that need to happen in that book, but it's still like an outline. Mm-hmm. And then right. I break that outline into like, eh, this is probably the moment that should be the cutoff point between what's issue one and issue two. Right. That's... And then I work on issue one and I just zoom in. And fill in all the details for issue one. Mm -hmm. Um, If while I'm doing that, something important comes up where I'm like, oh, the way I'm framing this, I have to have this pay off exactly this way. I will drop that into the outline roughly where it belongs so that I remember. Sure. You know, like, oh, you you have to have this specific solution to the problem to make this all work. But other than that, no, I don't start working on or, or doing detailed stuff on issues, you know, four, five, six until it's time to do issue four or issue five or issue six. Um, the outline means that you tend to not paint yourself into as many corners still can happen. Right. Um, but I like that better than than writing everything out and then uh I don't know. There's something lifeless about it for me. It also I, makes the writing process daunting where it's like, now I have to come up with the whole story. Yeah. I have to write feel, the whole story. I feel like whenever you do that amount of like that much planning ahead of time, it also takes just the wind out of the sails. Yes. Like, yeah, you, you spent all your energy. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, when it, when it comes to the actual, art of the of an issue too i don't i know there are artists who will will like thumbnail all their pages and they'll do those in order you know one to Mm -hmm. 24 or whatever and then they'll go back to page one and start penciling and doing the final pencils and they'll pencil one through 24 and then they go time to do inks and start at page one and ink up through page 24 and then the same four colors if they're doing the colors or whatever a lot of times that 
even an artist who's writing and drawing their own stuff tends to have somebody else color it. But um, that feels like doing the issue three, four times to me. So instead, I'll I'll work on them in chunks that are like scenes, and so I'll I'll thumbnail and draw one, two, five pages. That mm. sounds more fun because you get to see that scene kind of come to life, right? And then I'll I'll actually like take it all the way to final colors. Uh huh. Before cool. I start working on page six, <laughs> sometimes because it's like I wanna I wanna see this all the way through. I also on any yeah. given day, like it's nice to not just be like, well, it's it's penciling week or it's 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 oh. two weeks of penciling. <laughs> and because it's not rough when, you, when you're in the middle of those pencils, you're like, man, today all I really want to do is ink. I really right. want to get into like some cool texture stuff. Or man, today I just want to sit in front of the computer and be doing digital colors. I want to be painting. I don't yeah. want to be drawing in pencil and whatever. And so this means that it's constantly changing. Mm-hmm. You know, every you couple of days you're changing what you're doing and, and it's that variety and you don't get uh, burnt out on any one part of the process. And even if you are a little burnt out, like, man, today I don't want to be inking, but I've got to ink this page. It's like, but tomorrow I'm going to start over on pencils on the on the next series of pages. Are they coming for you? Alan? Sorry, you might be able to hear my kid. My kid's home. So she's I can hear her screaming. <laughs> Which means I know you're good. I don't, don't hear anything. I uh, assume it's the police. They had found you. I definitely, uh, well, we're a little over time, but what I'd okay. like to do is have you back on with um, and Sean someday, if you're, you and Sean are BFFs, um, talk about okay. world building. I want to do an episode on world building. Everyone so, wants Sean and I to not be good, and I not, don't Not me. That. I would love it for you guys. I think you guys are, <laughs> I think it's hilarious. I think that, that little rumor of you guys not getting on is hilarious, but. Well, here's the weird thing. I think Sean has bought into that rumor as well. And I don't. I think that's just because he's he, Sean's a weirdo. Why not? Okay. okay. <laughs> like Sean, sh- sh- everything you can't say anything to that dude without him getting worked up. Just kidding, Sean. <laughs> don't don't take it seriously if you're watching. Um, no, but I think I've been wanting to do a couple more episodes on world building because I think it's cool to get different sp- perspectives. You know, like you have like I'm not gonna show this notebook, but you know, the notebook itself has uh, like. Your ideas I got from you, and then ideas I got from Sean, and some of them are similar, and some of them are 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 different, but none of them are wrong. Is my point, right? You know, like, yeah, I rem- so. I remember when I did a talk about world building, where you were, and got to yeah. you know got to get that feedback and stuff, and 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 hear what I had to say about world building. Uh, a lot of people had also attended a, a, a lecture and 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 lesson from sean about world building yeah and uh it was really interesting to have so many people who had done both come up and go like wow it's really different approaches or i you know i like yours better or i like sean's better but you had some interesting things to say and it was like i think that's where some of that like yeah people think we're at odds because <laughs> it's like these competing world building talks it's like no i mean if you talk to anyone have, working on like we have like, different I, approaches yeah, I guarantee you, I would. There's probably stuff I do differently than you guys. But I, I also you know. think like the output is different. Like the, you know, what we're what we're coming up with stuff for is different. And I don't just mean thematically sure. or what the visuals are. I mean like I'm writing a comic where we are following characters, and it's it's like <laughs> moment by moment. This isn't meant to be um, a world that's just an image. And you understand, you both, mm-hmm. you understand and quit like Sean, I know Sean does do some, some prose work with his stuff. And I know he's talked about doing some, some graphic novel stuff, yep. which I actually think would probably mean he'd, he'd end up inadvertently changing some of his world building as he was going, because he was writing for narrative comics, as opposed to a little bit of prose mashed with just volumes of, of standalone imagery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and writing for that is kind of more like writing for a role playing game. Like I am trying to get this big picture. I am trying to make it so that when somebody sees my artwork, when they see a volume of my book, not only does all of this stuff make sense cohesively as a world, Mm -hmm. but that you understand it. And that's very different than having characters 
walk around in it where the audience is supposed to care about the characters rather than the world. Sure. So we're yeah. we're coming from different places, but it's also because what the end product is is so different. It's different, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's... And I think that's good for people to... Um, it's, it would be cool for people to hear that, so... But, like I said, we're about 20 minutes over time now, which is fine. Sorry. But, no, it's not your fault. <laughs> I was I would it's, take us another thirty minutes if I if I didn't have my wife barreling in here in a minute. I was gonna say honestly, at this point, it should never be considered overtime. It's yeah, like, yeah we just keep going. We would keep going if we could. It's just like you know, we like Andrew's got a kid that's gonna wake up soon. I got a kid that's apparently screaming. So, um, but let's um, let's have you on again with Sean. That'd be great. Um, but thank you for being on today. I appreciate you know you taking the time. You're welcome. I appreciate yeah. waking up an extra hour. Thanks early. for having me. <laughs> I mean, I slept in, so I'm good. I'm just kidding. You don't get to sleep in when you have a three year old at home, guys. Oh, and that's yeah. They're they're up at like the, as soon as the sun comes up. She's like, "Sun's up, I'm up, let's go." And you're like, "Go back to sleep, please. Just go back to sleep." Yep. It never works. But um, yeah. Okay, so let's uh let's schedule again. Anyone who's watching, I appreciate it. Not a lot of people ask questions today, which is weird. Normally, people are bombarding me with stuff, but um, nobody, nobody, everybody knows all the answers with me. You probably just you you said all the I, right things, man. I well, it's like I stream, you know. Uh, that's true. You're streaming on Twitch like, all the time, so yeah. Anybody, hear. anybody who wanted to ask me a question probably already has, and is like, I'm tired of hearing the answer. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, well, you still asked a question because you never know who's listening. Um, that's true. Cool. Well, you guys, but I'm saying, yeah. I'm going to take us off. Give me a second. I'm going to take us offline. Uh, our next guest is Friday the 25th. His 20th. And it's going to be Eric Wilkerson. Uh, it'll be a late night show, though, because he's got to take care of work and his kids, too. So he'll be on, we'll be on at 9 Wait, there's a late Sunday. night option? I gave you Friday or Sunday. You picked Sunday. Okay, so Sunday means early. Sunday is usually early. Friday is <laughs> usually at night. Yeah. yeah. Uh so we'll do the world building one on a Friday wow. night <laughs> so you can sleep in until we start. 